Hey everyone, after more than 15 years in the business, I finally got a book published. If you want to do me the biggest favor in the whole world, please head over to MikeyOp.com and buy a copy. That's M-I-K-E-Y-O-P-P.com, and the book is named Martyr, and it's about psychics and the history and future of the universe. I wrote it, and I think you'll love it. Hi everybody, this is Mike Oppenheim, and you are listening to Coffin Talk, Interviews with the Living, a weekly podcast that explores how our views on death affect the way we live our life. And this week we have someone from across the pond, Alan Murdy. He's in the UK and he's going to tell us all about poltergeists and ghosts and apparitions and psi phenomena and other things because he's an expert on it. He has written and broadcast extensively on paranormal topics for local, national, international media. My brother, who is the booking manager of the show, was so delighted to get on the show and I am feeling very lucky to get to talk to him today. Alan, how are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you very much, Mike, for the invitation. It's very nice indeed to be with you all. Awesome. So uh, before we get into the nitty gritty of the show, what got you into this subject in the first place? Like going back as far into your childhood as it as it goes. Well, I think it was because I grew up in a quite rural area in the east of England, um, a, a village in the county of Suffolk. And I think it was because I had a, a, an elderly lady who lived in the village most of her life, um, who had uh, been born there about the year 1900, and uh, she used to tell me local ghost stories and stories about witches. And the town um, nearby where, where I was living was uh, a very historic place called Bury St. Edmunds. It has a fine... Uh, I had a fine medieval abbey up until the reign of Henry VIII, and even to this day, the, the, the remaining portions of the abbey, there are two enormous medieval gateways, which are, are very impressive, are some of the finest surviving monastic architecture uh, in, in the UK. And there were plenty of ghostly stories about monks and grey ladies in the town uh, as I was growing up as a child, and I just got interested. And that interest has studied with me into well into adulthood. That's so great. That's that's seriously awesome. And uh, obviously, the show leans towards uh, your subject as well as any other. And we're just really interested in exploring not only like what could possibly be going on behind the delicate fabric of reality that we see but also what could possibly be happening before or after our existence so i am kind of curious i usually wait to ask this but um what do you think happens to a human when they die well that's a that's a very good question um i have a religious faith uh i'm a practicing member of the church of england uh so i i go along with uh, the hope of uh, a life after death or uh, a resurrection in some form as a matter of faith uh, of course, and of course there are many views of what the afterlife is, and I have to say the Church of England is is rather vague on, on the actual fine details however, leaving aside questions of faith uh, my work in psychical research, which is about what we can say scientifically what can we what can we actually prove? I think uh, in terms of uh, proof or evidence of survival after death, if we are to look at the material which has been collected by researchers, uh, serious researchers, for more than a century, I think you can make a strong prima facie case that some, some element of consciousness does survive after death, uh, at least for a short period, is what one might say. It's worth looking into. Uh, I think there are too many cases from too many uh, places in the world and too much suggestive evidence. I mean, if we look at, I mean, practically every religious belief in human history has some idea of survival after death, has an idea of ghosts. Uh, so a lot of cultures going back many, many thousand years will reach that same conclusion. And I don't think it's simply a case of, uh, of just wishful thinking on the part of humanity uh, about this. So I think there, are, there is a huge ongoing part of human experience. And what interests me particularly are the similarities between 
some of these experiences. And that makes me think that, yes, there, you can at least make a, a prima facie case. It's, uh, it, it death still remains a mystery. What happens afterwards? Well, ultimately, one has faith. There is some evidence, let me say, as well, to back up survival. But the ultimate form that may take, if you look at it purely from a, a uh, evidential point of view, where, well, I think there, there are many questions there. What I also say, however, is before we get on to the matter of uh, life after death or survival of uh, consciousness um, after death and bodily dissolution, is we don't actually understand human consciousness here and now. <laughs> in living people, uh, the, the, the brain still remains uh, an immense mystery. Uh, and of course, yeah, the, the problem of consciousness is one that uh, Western philosophers have been trying to, to uh, weigh up for 500 or more years, and Eastern cultures have been thinking about in one form or another for much longer than that. So there's, before we even get on to the question of ghosts, the paranormal, uh, spirits, survival after death, there's a whole lot of mysteries we can't explain here and now. Yeah, you know, it's really funny because uh, a parallel to that is a lot of people are really into space exploration, and I constantly wonder if we also should be exploring all the depths of the ocean even, because just right here on Earth, we have not explored even remotely like that. And so I, I definitely agree with you that consciousness is the beginning and end of all of Western civilization and thought and philosophy. And so I loved your answer. That's a great answer. And I do want to kind of um, uh, pull at the thread that you introduced at the very beginning of your answer, which is when you... We talk about faith and science. I'm, I'm more curious as as a person, not as um, uh, in your career. How do you balance those two things? Because that's kind of what the show is also about, is how do we balance faith versus science or reality, whichever term people prefer to use? Well, I, I think one way is to actually realize that um, they, they occupy um, diff, different territories in a way. Um, you know, Science can tell us how the material part of the world works, but there are a lot of questions we can't answer scientifically. Uh, and, of course, when it comes on to questions of, of morals and culture and values, science has got nothing to say on that at all. Uh, you can't prove a lot of things uh, in laboratory tests. I mean, my own work, uh, daily work, over the years as a lawyer is all about those situations. You cannot prove certain things scientifically. Uh, so we, I mean, particularly events in the, in the wider world, we need another way to approach the evidence. Um, and so that's why we have courts. Uh, and I, I don't, I'm not saying for one moment the courts or tribunal systems in any nation on earth are perfect, but they're about the best way we've, got, we've found over many, many years of testing evidence that you can't prove. I mean, I'll, I'll give, you, give you an example. Mm -hmm, please. Um, the criminal law. Um, you may be able to prove from uh, DNA tests and from blood tests uh, in an unpleasant crime like incest uh, that a, a man has impregnated his daughter and she's had a baby. What you can't prove scientifically, clinically, is whether he raped her. Mm. Wow. That's why we have to have, have a call. Or, or give another example. If a scientist is accused of faking results in a laboratory in a series of clinical trials, say for um, testing of some kind of medicine or, or drug or, or any scientific subject, you can't use the evidence of the clinical tests alone to determine that the person faked the results. You need other ways of analysing the evidence. And these are things that the, the courts have to, you know, have to deal with on a daily basis. There's a whole lot of things you can't prove scientifically. And of course, it's, it's difficult to prove historical events. Uh, it's, uh, and it, you also get one-off events in, in nature that uh, uh, don't repeat, like things like, I'm thinking of astronomy, where you get stars or the appearance of comets. Um, you, 
you know, you can't repeat those. Uh, <laughs> to, to, you know, we, we, can, we can build up a picture of the world, but one thing that science can't really philosophically say is something, uh, and this, is, this, this again is what happens when you bring a, a scientific expert into the courtroom, they can never say definitely, they can only give you a set of results that they got and their professional opinion. So they can give you probabilities that something happens, but you can't ultimately prove a great many things that occur outside clinical conditions. And where I leave this into in terms of ghosts and poltergeists activity, particularly pol poltergeist activity, these are things which don't occur um, in laboratories. Um, there's been experiments and tests suggesting over many, many years uh, that there is a power or ability in human consciousness to influence matter, but the effects that get reported in laboratories are, uh, are nowhere near as spectacular as our claim to go on in haunted houses and poltergeist uh, shattered homes, for instance, where large-scale events are taking place. Now, you can't, because of course it's taking place outside a clinical controlled environment, you have to use the best evidence you can, uh, which is eyewitness testimony and also uh, recordings, because um, you record poltergeist raps and effects. But and, and quite often these are short lived one off events. However, that doesn't mean we can't come up with a, a high standard of proof for them. Because in the courtrooms of North America and of Great Britain and, and the British Commonwealth, we have a, a way of approaching evidence which is known as similar fact evidence. And it's based on the principle that human behavior falls into patterns. It's used, actually, to, uh, and has been used for the best part of 140 years to convict people of some of the most serious offences on the statute book, particularly cases of serial murder, um, which is which is often often been applied for because of course in many murder cases there are no witnesses, but nonetheless it, you can take a cumulative approach to different pieces of evidence, and also there are patterns um, that occur with certain offenders. They commit crimes in a particular way, in a, they have a particular modus operandi. They, they, they repeat their behavior. And as a result, you can end up with where, where there are instances of separate, what appear to be separate crimes, but there are striking similarities between them, sometimes miles apart and years apart, taking those together that becomes proof. The classic one is a is a case, um, the case of Smith in 1915, who was a famous um, British murderer. And what Mr. Smith did was uh, it was known as the Brides in the Bath case. Now, Mr. Smith um, basically married a lady after insuring her wife, her life, and getting her to make a will. And the first Mrs. Smith tragically drowned in the bath soon after the marriage. Well, that was a terrible accident, everybody said. How, how absolutely terrible. Then he went, went and got married again. And lo and behold, a second Mrs. Smith died in exactly the same way soon after her life had been insured and her will had been made. Well, there was then, unfortunately, a third case of a Mrs. Smith, the third Mrs. Smith, died in exactly the same circumstances. And the approach of the court basically was, well, once is tragic, second is the most horrible, tragic coincidence. When it happens a third time, it's murder. And that principle, effectively, similar fact evidence, where you've got separate crimes, is used, uh, reports, you piece them together, it forms a pattern. You look at all the other possible explanations um, that reasonably might apply, but if you can come down with no other explanation than it was this person, the guilt can be established 
proved beyond reasonable doubt. Now, what you might say has got this got to do with poltergeist. Well, the thing about poltergeist activity is it's been reported around the world for many hundreds of years. Many, many cases have been reported. What's interesting about poltergeists, and you can look at ones in um, throughout Europe, North America, South America, um, Far East Asia, Africa, the range of poltergeist phenomena in these cases, many years, many miles apart, is very similar. If you were, in fact, there was a, there was a French um, detective in 1950 who was interested in poltergeists. He wrote a book um, called, uh, it was a man called Tizane, and he said, well, look at these cases years apart I've dealt with in France of poltergeist activity. And he called the book On the Trail of the Man We Can Never Catch. And if you apply the same standards of evidence we use in courtrooms, then I think poltergeist activity is proved. It's because all the cases come down to basically similar patterns of phenomena, similar social circumstances. If it was a courtroom, then... There's more evidence, say, I mean, I'm thinking of a famous British poltergeist case of the 1970s, the Enfield poltergeist. It went on for two years. I knew the two um, two of the leading investigators, Morris Gross and Guy Lyon Playfair. And the problem with the Enfield poltergeist is it turned up too much evidence. There was, there was a vast amount of testimony and, and recordings there. Uh, and it, what was established in that case far exceeds the evidence in many criminal trials. So the evidence is all there. Um, what the big question, of course, is how we how we interpret it. What 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 do we think is going on? And there, well, you can say the jury is out <laughs> still. I had I had a couple questions that were all about the same kind of topic, so I'll just kind of condense it into one. How much do you care about? people who are not just non-believers but are adamantly against the concepts that you're exploring and introducing and writing about hey everyone if you're a fan of the show please head over to mikeyop.com and click the subscribe button it's the best way to support us and it's free that's m-i-k-e-y-o-p-p dot com thanks well i'm a great believer in uh, free speech and inquiry and i you know i i I, in terms of them, you know, that they have a right to their opinion. And I also think it's important that evidence is tested. And if if they can come up with evidence or a means of falsifying any evidence on a particular point, then I welcome it. Uh, serious, serious criticism, serious skepticism is nothing to be afraid of. Um, you know, and, and, you know, and I think it's very, very important, particularly with matters such as how the world works, human consciousness, we have the widest freedom to explore these questions. So the fact that, I mean, I, I chair the Ghost Club in Great Britain, and the Ghost Club has, is is open to anybody, regardless of whether they believe in ghosts or not. It, what it does is it provides a, a neutral space for people um, where skeptics and believers and people who are just... Um, not sure either way can meet on common ground and explore these these subjects. Um, so I, I have, I mean, my own view. If I, I think we can divide the world into four categories of ghosts. I always say there are some people who believe in ghosts. There are some people who are open-minded, or maybe not committed, or maybe just don't really care. And then there are people who firmly don't believe in ghosts. I also think there's a fourth category. There are some people who shouldn't believe in ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> because it, it, clearly, if, if they are deeply sceptical, uh, and what, what are we, the, the giveaway is if they start to get angry about it. Um, uh, and re really, it's not something to get angry over. There's, there's plenty of things that go on in the world you can get angry about without adding ghosts to it. To it. But if, if they are deeply sceptical about it, I often think, well, it's best you don't believe in it, because it might just it might just have to mean a massive rearrangement of your picture of how the world works. 
and the implications. And it, I think maybe on some deeper level, we may have our own kind of built-in biological resistance to the psychic world. And I think it pro- that may account for why it can be so, become such a controversial topic. It may account that there is something in us actually built in, inherently into our organisms to stop us straying too much into the psychic realm or dimension or however you would like to put it, a kind of, um, a kind of filter or barrier. Uh, and that most simply because we're, we're clearly designed to work in a world of matter and some, some scientists, some philosophers have thought that the brain actually, rather than receiving psychic impressions, wherever they come from, is actually a mechanism to stop us receiving them. Oh, wow. It, 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 it filters out what is out there. Um, and as a result, it's kind of sensory barrier. Uh, it, uh, there was a, um, a French physiologist who came up with this theory, he's a called Bergson. But actually, the brain is there to actually protect us from the psychic world. Now, some people, their their boundary or their barrier is not quite as strong. It's more porous or more fluid, and these these people, um, you know, become mediums or psychics. They they get much much um, stronger impressions than than one does. I mean, it's 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 a fascinating area. I. I never heard that and I, I love that concept and that's so interesting to me and i the only thing I, I can even think of that comes close to it is i've noticed having raised children that we do kind of push them to not believe in ghosts and other paranoid paranormal things and i've i've often wondered if we're doing a disservice to ourselves and them by like telling no no that's not real what you're sensing isn't real no 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 there's no such thing um do you have any thoughts on that well i, th- I think that's that's could, could be um, there could be a lot there. I mean, it's the, uh, the maybe social conditioning. It may be something biological. It also may explain why people get spooked out, why they get creepy feelings. That there, uh, and we also know that um, certainly the the if we talk we call them that the higher mammals like cats and dogs, domestic animals seem to have some kind of psychic sensitivity. Um, and there's, there's a long tradition, particularly of dogs, cats, and uh, horses, and one or two other animals, seemingly reacting to things like haunted houses. There was an interesting experiment done about 50 years ago by a parapsychologist called Bob Morris in a haunted house in Kentucky where there had been a, uh, a murder in the past. It was a haunted room. And he had, he had the interesting idea of taking along different animals. He, he took along a dog. Uh, he took along a cat, uh, a, a white rat, and a rattlesnake to see how they reacted in this particular room. And he got strong reactions from the dog. Uh, he started barking at something one of the humans could see. Similarly, with the cat, it reacted very strongly, uh, hurt, first in the end, and ran out of the room. Uh, they couldn't detect any uh, difference in the behaviour of the of the white rat, but when they brought the rattlesnake in, it immediately adopted a posture of defence ah. um, and, and, and was reacting apparently to something which they thought concentrated on uh, a particular spot in the room uh, which had contained a chair where the victim of the murder had died. Now, that was a very interesting experiment because it's very much a one-off, but it would be an interesting one to repeat. And I think I think there's a, anybody who has a, a cat or a dog may be able to sense sometimes that or see or observe their dog or their cat reacting in a way uh, which can't easily be, be explained. I mean, there's lots of literature, many anecdotes of dogs that seem to know when their owners are coming home and will go and wait by the door or wait by the gate when their, their, their owner, their master or their mistress is, is coming back. And another, another one you find all over the world 
whose cats seem to know when they are about to be taken to the veterinary surgeon. And if you ask a, you know, ask a veterinary surgeon, um, you can do this in England, in the United States, I've, I've done it in South America, do you have problems with cats keeping appointments? And they all say yes, because somehow the cat seems to know and, uh, and, and goes over uh, if it can avoid it. Uh, and so I think, you know, there are psychic sort of things going on in, in, in everyday life around us. Um, you know, these, these things are indeed very common. I mean, I've been collecting ghost stories. Um, I've, I, I've, I've collected over 300 first-hand ghost stories from people in the last 20 years or notes and things, and personal experiences people have told me. And I, I should think only about maybe six or seven of those um, have ever been published anywhere. I mean, I've, 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 I've published some of them myself, but anywhere else independently in other books or magazines, it's a very small fraction of what is a huge aspect of human experience. I mean, gosh, when I read in your bio that you were a lawyer, I kept thinking, how is that going to tie into his other career or, or both careers? And it, it's obvious from the minute you start talking because you're you're really all about helping people achieve like an, an equilibrium or a balance between the competing perspectives nowadays, which is an all or nothing kind of paradigm where you either are a quote unquote wacko who believes in like anything beyond, you know, Newtonian physics to like, oh, you're you're too much of a realist and you're not giving you know space and room to other people and the diverse impressions we have and experiences so i love absolutely love your approach to what you do and i think i would like to close by asking you how would you explain your life purpose with regards to this to other people like what is the motivation what would you like to see happen in your lifetime with your research and with all the work you're doing well i would uh, I, there's, there's lots of Things that um, I would like to see researched. So, in, uh, in the uh, in, in huge amounts of things to learn about the universe, first of all, in, in all directions. And it's uh, and I don't think we're ever going to learn everything about it because everything, every time we do make an advance, we seem to realise how much more bigger and more complex and wonderful the, uh, the, these questions are. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a continual, continual search which will go on. Uh, however long humanity lasts. In terms of my contribution to it, I, 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 I'm, as I said, I'm interested particularly in what we call spontaneous cases, that is those cases that happen to um, ordinary people going about their lives outside uh, clinical or laboratory testing conditions. There's been a, quite a big change as everybody, I mean, in fact, we're having a podcast, something which you know, wouldn't have taken place 20 years ago very easily. We know that we're in the, the process of a, of a huge amount of technological change in the, the world. I suppose what I do at now, the age I've reached, is I'm, I'm, I feel perhaps I'm a bridge between the old older style of psychical research and ghost investigation and the more modern, new, different approaches, which can go off in many, many directions. Um, some people are you know, very keen on equipment-based ghost hunting, which I, I personally think is only one approach. And I would like to, what I would like to myself is to ensure that what was learned in the past is not forgotten, that it does actually get past on to a new generation, uh, because one of the problems with uh, a subject like ghost hunting or, uh, in, or psychical research, particularly in spontaneous cases, those that go on in the wider world, is that typically the investigative work has been in the hands of a small number of dedicated researchers, and they they get interesting results, and collect lots of material, then in the natural course of things they, they pass on and die themselves, quite often without any successes. And sometimes it can be years or uh, decades before anyone goes back to their research. What I would like to try and do is encourage some kind of continuity between uh, the, you know, the research that went on in the past and the new directions that the whole new generation of people with fresh insights may take it. 
um, the fact is you know, the world the world learns more as it runs along, but it doesn't mean it was stupid before. Wow. I mean, uh, that's, I could ask you a million more questions. We have a time limit for a reason because people just fade away after about the 30-minute mark. But um, nothing you have said has been short of compelling for me. And I love your approach because I think your approach to what you do with regards to the paranormal is an approach we could all take to just reality in general, which is evidence-based but also open-minded to the subjective experience and all that we're experiencing. So thank you so much, Alan Murdy, for coming on the show. And uh, there will be notes to buy your book, but I'd love to hear about it. Right, yes, well, I have a book coming out uh, a little later, which is called Phantom Ladies. And uh, it was originally written by a good friend of mine, a ghost hunter for many years, a man called Andrew Green, and he published it in 1977. Well, I've, I'm the literary executive for Andrew, and this book, I think, has been rather forgotten, so I uh, had edited a new edition and presumptuously uh, added uh, some more text and some more ideas about things that we've discovered in the uh, 45 years since the original book, checked it out, and it's it is the first, as far as I know, published guide to sites in Great Britain which where the ghost is specifically or exclusively female. Hence its title, Phantom Ladies. So it's a whole whole study of uh, female apparitions. And that should be coming out a bit, bit later this summer. Oh my gosh, that sounds great. I can't wait for that to come out, and the release of this episode should be timed quite harmoniously with that. So for everyone listening, please make sure to check that out. And also, there's tons of other stuff you can read and see with Alan's work all over the internet. So um, as I said, he's doing great work, and uh, it was really, really awesome to have you on the show. Thank you so much for making time for us. And for everyone else listening at home, the number one way to support the show is to head over to MikeyOp.com. That's M-I-K-E-Y-O-P-P.com. And sign up for free for the weekly letter that I write, as well as the podcast announcement. To everyone listening, once again, this has been an episode of Coffin Talk. My name is Mike Oppenheim, and we will see you soon.